It's time for your weekly update on all things tax. The Tax Factor from Blick Rothenberg. With Nimesh Shah and Robert Salter. Welcome to The Tax Factor, our weekly podcast from Blick Rothenberg. Each week, our team of experts looks at the news and updates in the world of tax and provides analysis of what it might mean for you or your business. I'm Nimesh Shah, CEO of Blick Rothenberg, and joining me again this week for his second appearance in a row is Global Mobility Director Robert Salter. Robert, welcome back to The Tax Factor, and we've got a real pick and mix of tax stories this week. Hello, and thank you for having me two weeks in a row. Robert, we usually end The Tax Factor with a child benefit case, but let's kick off with one this time. There seems to be a flurry of cases on child benefit recently. And this latest case concerning Miss Robson related to discovery assessments and referenced the now famous Wilkes case. So first of all, Robert, remind us of what the Wilkes case established and what happened to the case of Miss Robson. So the Wilkes case involved a situation where somebody was not in the self-assessment tax system, was only over £50,000 a year, hadn't been asked to do tax returns or whatever. HMRC came along and said, well, your spouse is claiming the child benefit. We want to use the discovery assessment, which is basic tax legislation to discover unpaid taxes. And the Court of Appeal said, no, you're not a self-assessment. This is not income. You're not paying you're not having income, you're not paying an income tax, you're paying a charge, which is a separate legislative issue. So they said HMRC is not allowed to do that. Now that was then superseded to some extent by the Shisunak when he was Chancellor, which said, fine, subject to T's and C's on a go forward basis, we're widening the definition of a discovery assessment and saying people in this situation in future can be liable still to the revenue discovering the fact that they've been living with somebody, the child benefit, etc. involved. Mrs. Lobson's case then involved the situation of was she still within the ease within the wider regulations which said she could be protected by the Wilkes case or whether she's going to be caught by the new terms. The first tier tribunal said no, she's definitely within the easement terms within this situation. She's allowed to use the Wilkes case fully and therefore she's not liable for child benefit and they were incredibly scathing of HMRC and the HMRC approach. Interesting case here. I think Wilkes was also interesting for the reasons that you said as well, Robert, that Sunak did reverse the principles established in the Wilkes case and had a retrospective legislation to counteract that for people claiming that in the future. This case of Miss Robson, as you said, HMRC were trying to get out of the Wilkes principles. The T's and C's said, actually, no, the Wilkes principles did apply. I think this is the first one I've seen that the tribunals held up that the Wilkes principles should apply. I've seen a few where taxpayers have tried it on, but hasn't quite worked. I do wonder whether we'll see more Wilkes type situations, but there wouldn't be a window that closes because the government did make this retrospective change. Yes. Yeah, so, and, you know, the window isn't particularly wide. So for example, it's people who appealed before I think it's the end of June 2021. And then it's also depending on how HMRC acted up until like the end of October 2021. So basically, there's a, an absolute window of people out there. But you know, where you do meet the T's and C's, I would absolutely say go back to HMRC, potentially go to the tribunal because HMRC have no right to this money, they got their systems long, it's not the taxpayer's fault for HMRC failings. Absolutely try and use the legislation and the case law where you can. And well done to Miss Robson, represented herself and was successful at the tribunal. You don't hear about that too often. No, and that's, that's, that, that requires courage. So Robert, taking us away from my pet hate of child benefit, turning our attention to one of your many areas of interest, IR35, uh, you spotted an interesting case this week. Worth a quick reminder on what these IR35 rules actually are. Yeah, so IR35 is kind of an industry shorthand for issues about deemed employment and who should be operating PAY and NIC, for example, and when it should apply. It goes back 20 years, but it's been gradually tightened over the last 20 years. And the MyPay case basically deals with the issue of whether you have an overarching employment or whether, for example, each individual employment period that an agency worker works for them is you know, an independent period of, of work. At the moment, it's still kind of in the ongoing stages. So this was almost like a pre-trial judgment. And to some extent, it's based on narrow technicalities in terms of how much of the appeal, what basis they had for the further appeals and everything. But it does raise interesting case law about where is there are ongoing employment? Can you get business expense claims, for example, where you have a six-month assignment to this client, a six-month assignment to that client, for example, and there's eligibility for temporary workplace relief, which is obviously the revenue don't want you to get it, but 
if and if you treat each employment separately, basically the rules about temporary workplace to leave, so your business travel costs and the accommodation costs, etc., don't apply. You have to have an ongoing employment and then be posted to a different client, a different workplace, etc., to get that. So obviously HMRC are trying to argue this is loads of individual contracts rather than one overarching agreement. Again, more interesting sort of IR35 principles. I know this is an area you follow very closely, Robert, and no shortage of IR35 cases, employee versus self-employed. I think one thing listeners should be watching out for is I wonder how long this will be an issue. I wonder if a future government will align and harmonise the employment and self-employment regime so this issue potentially goes away in the future. But I think it's a watch this space type situation. Agreed. I think there is ways you could change it and improve it. And clearly, it creates a lot of confusion. It creates a lot of uncertainty for companies and it creates problems. And actually, in some ways, the way it works at the moment is actually quite detrimental for UK PLC because I've certainly, for example, had clients who basically just said, fine, we'll get our IT contractors for this six or 12 month project in Ireland rather than in the UK. So it's not helping the UK PLC in any way, shape or form. So I think it does need to be updated, improved, cleaned up and made more easy to follow, much more perhaps user friendly for the end clients or the kind of people having to make the assessment. And however they do that, you know, some countries in Europe have deemed employment rates, for example, some alternatively, your tax bans are so similar that there's no tax incentive to do this. And you're only doing it because that's the underlying business contractual reality of something, but it can definitely be improved. And uh, it would save a huge amount of court time as well, I expect. But moving away from the courts and looking at what HMRC have been up to. So I don't think HMRC have had the most positive PR recently with delaying taxpayer repayments, closing down phone lines over the summer, and apparently productivity suffering due to working at home. But some much needed praise for HMRC who have successfully brought down a fraudster who was based in a remote village in Indonesia. Robert, HMRC have definitely not been treating themselves to pina coladas on the Bali beaches. Why have they been and what have they been up to in Indonesia? They've been working very closely with obviously the Indonesian authorities, but also, for example, tax authorities and the police in countries like Australia, Canada, etc. to do this joint investigation. So this scammer was basically very well organized, could create phishing technology and everything like that, which people could literally buy and use wherever they were. And, you know, so they've really gone for the head of this and managed to kind of undermine this whole system. And hopefully that'll be a win for genuine people in the UK, both from a tax perspective, but also just in terms of general wider web- websites and things like that. And the only thing is, obviously, you get one head cut off, it's going to be a bit like some that Greek monster. And there's going to be other people coming along with similar technology. But it shows you HMRC can do something well. Give credit to HMRC because some of the criticism, absolutely valid, but give praise when it's due as well. Yep, well done, HMRC. And I think it's, again, another useful reminder of Heather's guidance from last week's episode uh, around HMRC and tax scams as people start to file their tax returns. And we couldn't be further away from the sunnier shores of Indonesia. The clocks have gone back, the weather's a bit more miserable, and the autumn statement is upon us in a few weeks. This could be Jeremy Hunt's last fiscal statement, as the number 10 rumours are suggesting. The Conservative government may take the wind out of Rachel Rees' sails by appointing Claire Coutinho, the Energy Secretary, as the UK's first female chancellor in time for the spring budget, which was probably the last budget before the general election and could fall on Halloween in 2024. Last week, Robert, you and Heather speculated a few areas that Jeremy Hunt may look at to tackle, and there continues to be attention on the 40% higher rate of tax. What do you think Jeremy Hunt might do around the higher rate tax threshold? Clearly, fiscal drag has punished a lot of people and put a lot of people who are not innately higher earners in a common sense perspective into the 40% tax band and you know put others into for example effectively 60% tax because of the withdrawal of personal loans or whatever increasing the tax bands whether it's all bands or just the 40% bands so say it goes from 50 to 60 or 65,000 would clearly be and provide some relief for some taxpayers the wider question though is how does this fit into wider economic policy as much as anything because reducing taxes Lovely. I like to pay less taxes. I think most people do. But you've then got the Bank of England's upping the base rate all the time, for example, to try and take money out of the economy. So you've kind of got mixed messaging there as well. So it'll be interesting to see how the politics and the chancellor's kind of obligations and opportunities fit into a wider economic situation. 
agree. It will be interesting to see whether Jeremy Hunt does cave into the pressure of increasing that threshold. And even if he does, the high rate threshold really hasn't kept up with inflation. 10 years ago, you paid high rate tax at around £44,000. With inflation, that should be about 65000 The numbers being talked about right now are increasing the threshold to 60000 So we're nowhere near that yet. And the other thing is as well, it then kind of creates other anomalies or kind of highlights other anomalies within the tax system. So it's kind of like, I think a lot of the time the politics politicians here are like fiddling whilst loan burns from a tax perspective. There's no, it would be great if they kind of took a step back and said, okay, what should the wider tax system look like? What are the appropriate bans? What about things like the child benefit clawback? Where should it apply? Should it apply at all? And all of that. And I think they're fiddling at the moment and all we're going to see is more fiddling come the autumn statement, unfortunately. It would be wonderful to have a long-term tax strategy, Robert. And finally, so my colleague Joe Neal, a manager in our private client team, looks through the monthly tax receipts for HMRC and Joe tells me that HM Treasury coffers have never looked so healthy. Annual tax receipts have exceeded 800 billion. That's over... 135 billion up on two years ago. And much of that increase is driven by income tax, which has increased by 12%, even though average pay growth currently sits at around 7.5%. In fact, all taxes have contributed to bumper tax receipts other than stamp duty land tax, which is down by over 20%. Not surprising given the housing market has slowed significantly with higher interest rates. I wonder if the government will be tempted into an SDLT cut to stimulate activity. My stamp taxes partner, Sean Randall, told Knight Frank this week that an SDLT cut would be an extraordinary thing to do now, given what we've seen in recent years with holidays, extensions, indefinite increases to the nil rate ban, and a reversal to make it temporary. I'm sure Sean will be watching closely to events on the 22nd of November as a barometer of how busy he might be over the next year or so. The Tax Factor. My thanks to Robert for joining me on this week's Tax Factor. Uh, We've covered a real eclectic mix of tax cases, HMRC's tax-bursting travels to Indonesia, and Jeremy Hunt possibly offering middle earners a tax giveaway as his last act at Chancellor, if the rumours are to be believed. We also want to hear from you. If you visit the Tax Factor page on our website, you'll find a form to contact us. Let us know the stories and topics that you'd like us to cover. We record the podcast on a Wednesday, so you can message us right up to the time we record. We can't give individual advice or responses to messages, but do let us know what is on your tax agenda. I'd also like to mention there is a new episode of our sister podcast, Brave Business, now available on our website, where we look at the topic of overcoming barriers for black entrepreneurs. Joining Declan Curry to discuss this issue and share their stories are guests Bola Youssef, founder of International Tax Search, and Kojo Marfo, founder of My Runway Group. You can find Brave Business and all previous episodes of The Tax Factor on the Blick Rothenberg website, and we release a new episode every Friday on all major podcast platforms. You can find all of our episodes on YouTube. That's all for this week. I'm back with our Autumn Statement special in a couple of weeks. Next week, it's Rob Goodley in the host chair, and I'm sure there'll be more Autumn Statement rumours to run through. I'm Namesh Shah, CEO at Blick Rothenberg. Goodbye and enjoy the weekend. That's all for this episode of The Tax Factor. Find all our previous episodes wherever you get your podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, why not try Brave Business, our podcast series for entrepreneurs. Find it wherever you get The Tax Factor or on the Blick Rothenberg website. The Tax Factor.